At issue this week, Ottawa is promising new money for provinces and municipalities to help with housing and infrastructure, but that cash comes with strings attached. If the province doesn't want to step up with ambition on building the infrastructure needed to support more housing uh, in general across the province, we'll do it specifically with willing partners. Some provinces say it's not for Ottawa to decide. I'm going to leave that up to each municipality to decide because they know better than the province and, and the federal government. So is Ottawa overreaching with these housing measures? Do political jurisdictions outweigh the need to address the housing crisis? Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton, here to break it down on At Issue Tonight. Chantelle Hebert, Andrea Coyne, and Althea Raj is back. Uh, Althea, because you're back, I'm, I'm going to start with you. What, what do you make of the way some provinces, not all, but some provinces have responded to this um, offer of money with some conditions in terms of how it should be used for zoning and, and other, other things? Well, I think it's understandable that uh, they would not want the federal government to interfere in their sphere of jurisdiction. Um, they also don't want to be holding the bag of blame. But I do think this is actually the strategy that the Liberals are welcoming because they want the Prime Minister to be cast as this defender of housing for all. And the premiers are the ones standing in the way. And so they're trying to make an issue that was an issue on which they were defensive, now they're on the offensive. And it's mm -hmm. the premier's fault that housing is not getting done. So this is it's almost like a dream scenario the Liberal government ha um, has planned. It, it does seem like a, a, a pretty big shift, Chantal, over the past 10 days, say, when, you know, all we heard was that Justin Trudeau was responsible for housing problems. And I'm sure we can we'll still hear that. But, but the script, as Althea points out, has flipped a little. Yes, uh, there's been a change in tone in the Prime Minister. Uh -huh. He is a lot more aggressive in his answers, not just on housing, on just about everything. I think they are uh -huh. liberal strategists who have come to the conclusion that it's impossible for Justin Trudeau to be more aggressive uh, than uh, Pierre Poilievre, uh -huh. his main opponent. But bottom line, if we are talking about how things work and how things get done, uh, the current federal strategy might be great on messaging, but it borders on uh, federalism malpractice. You are not going to get things done uh, without some heavy degree of cooperation between levels of government. And no amount of threats or saying, I challenge you to do this or else I won't do this from the federal government is going to change that. Uh, because Jurisdictions are not just about what it says in the Act uh, the Nor uh, uh, of North America. They're yeah. also about practicalities as who has the levers to do what. Uh, and in this instance, housing, um, meals for kids, etc., the provinces do. Sure, but, but uh, let me take the housing accelerator example, for instance. I, there, too, provinces had issues with it. So then uh, the, the federal government's just walked around and made deals with cities. If, if they work with the cities, what, what is the problem for the provinces? Chantal, you can respond to that, and then Andrew. At this point, the federal government is saying the cities will get more money for a, with a meeting a variety of conditions, uh, yeah. i.e. accepting the uh, charter for uh, people who rent, accepting ch uh, a change in their bylaws. I'm not sure the federal government is equipped to exact that from every city in the country. Sure. And in the province I live in, the cities are not allowed to accept no. that money yeah, in any event right. without that's going right. through the Quebec government. Andrew. Uh, I mean, the provinces are notorious uh, dogs in the manger about, you know, their, their jurisdictional issues, and they're never shy about uh, deciding how the federal government should exercise its responsibilities or advising on it. Uh, but just because they're self-interested or turf warriors doesn't mean they're wrong. Uh, people are, I see people saying, well, how can we get hung up on constitutional niceties at a time like this, meaning the division of powers in the Constitution? Um, but it's more than just, you know, legal mumbo-jumbo. There's some practical realities underlying it. Uh, it's not clear to me what the federal government knows about school lunches, for example, that the provinces don't. Uh, I'm not clear that they have a special expertise in rewriting, um, you know, municipal zoning laws. Uh, there's a reason why we do locate these things closer to the people. And what we do know also from when the federal government does get heavily into provincial jurisdiction, maybe with justification, maybe with some good sides to it, 
Uh, but if you look at the mess that healthcare is in right now, a large part of that is because there's no accountability. There's such blurred lines with, with, with the federal government funding this and the provinces funding that, uh, and everybody pointing fingers at each other. It makes it very hard to hold anybody to account or to get any change going on. So there's a reason for these constitutional lines. They're not just to satisfy lawyers. They're to make for more effective government. And when the federal government comes piling in like this, it isn't just a matter of that though Chantel is certainly right to say you're not going to get much done without provincial cooperation. Uh, but even if you get it, it's not clear you're going to get better government out of it. Althea? But the flip side yeah. Yeah, of that is that, you know, Pierre Poiliev, the conservative leader, has been prosecuting the case for more than a year that basically everything is Justin Trudeau's fault. That if you don't have a house, it's Justin Trudeau's fault. That if your kids are hungry, it's Justin Trudeau's fault. And so in that way, he's kind of given the liberals a bit of leeway to enter into areas of provincial jurisdiction and to area, into areas that are not traditionally seen as the role of the federal government to dictate terms in a way that I think gives him a little bit more cover. And frankly, this is an area where I would say most conservative, uh, sorry, most liberal caucus members are actually supportive. They are more center left. And these are things that they would like to see get done. And they would like to see their government have a record. And now it feels like he he's finally waging battle, he being the prime minister here. Yeah, so yeah. Um, we can argue about what's in the British North America Act. And I think <laughs> we will all agree about what's in the British North America Act. But when it comes to people's perceptions, they don't really care which government is giving them X or Y. They just want to know that it's happening. I, I don't disagree. But that's that, not the point. That, the point yeah. is you're not going to get any of this done unless the provinces and the municipalities engage. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not a question of what's written anywhere. The federal government, unless Justin Trudeau wants yeah. a second job delivering sandwiches, is not about to find which school but, needs more but, but if meals no, and he, wheels but or not free going lunches. To do that. Yeah. He's going to hand over money to the provinces and they're going to administer their system. The yeah. fact is, on a lot of issues, actually, we had a lot of provinces say no initially and then get to a yes, like on child care, for child example. Care, yeah. So it's not yeah. necessarily um, a no-no, like he doesn't have partners to work with. I yeah. think on some of the housing stuff, what is interesting yeah. is where the provinces are drawing the lines. Like in Ontario, for example, the Liberals are banking on the fact that people want housing and they're speaking to millennials and Generation Z that want a house wherever it is, whatever it looks like. And the Premier seems to be talking to older Canadians who live in suburbs and don't want to see a four flat yeah. uh, yeah, set up sure. next to them. Hey, who hey. will win that battle? I don't know. But like there, there are yeah. interesting nuances in that discussion, too. Andrew. Uh, Andrew. I don't disagree that Pierre Paul Everett has been just as uh, um, you know, willing to disregard yeah. uh, the division of powers as the feds are, and, uh, as the Liberals are. And I can see Justin Trudeau effectively picking, uh, uh, taking a, a Pierre Paul Yev's strategy or page out of his strategy by picking fights with people. And I think that's what this is mostly about. Whether or not he gets the cooperation with the provinces, I think, I think the Liberals are living day to day at this point. And what they really need in the short term is to see the Prime Minister out fighting with people and showing, showing you know, dan getting his dander up. And I think that's mostly what this is about. I, I'm just saying it may be good politics. I'm not at all clear it's good policy. But Chantal, doesn't the federal government have to try and do something given, as Althea said, that they were they were wearing so much of the blame for housing? Or, 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 so, or, or so, is it the way they so approached in the, it? So in the, in the old, old days, <laughs> if you were going to do something efficient and you really believed that you were going to do it, instead of having a summit on car thefts, you would have called in the premiers and worked out a consensus on a way forward and listen to the points of views of people who are actually closer to the front line than you are. Mm. But I agree with Andrew, this is not about public policy. This is about politics. Now, that being said, yes, provinces will make deals to get money, but time is running out and the temptation to wait out the liberals at this point, unless they get a bump in the polls from this, mm -hmm. is going to be increasingly appealing to premiers. Althea, you want a last word there? I will just say that on this um, flurry of pre-budget announcements, which are actually kind of rare, it does make me wonder what's actually in the budget. Like, it's a smart strategy to have the things that you want talked about announced early, because when there's too much, you know, it gets crowded out on the day of the budget. But it kind of makes me wonder if there's a really bad piece of news <laughs> that there were, they were worried would crowd out everything else. At issue from the foreign interference inquiry, former conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says meddling from China cost his party as many as nine seats.
I think there was enough misinformation and, and voter suppression to perhaps change the outcome in as many as that. But O'Toole doesn't dispute the overall outcome of the election. There were a number of reasons we lost, but in some seats where there was evidence of, of misinformation and interference, we continued to work with officials quietly behind the scenes. So what's been made of the latest testimony from the inquiry and the former Conservative leader? Let's bring back everybody, Chantal, Andrew and Althea. Andrew, I'll start with you. What, let's talk about Mr. O'Toole's claims there specifically. Um, it also beca It's also become apparent over a few days now that it doesn't seem like information was being shared with the people it needed to be shared with or, or dealt with properly. But, but give me your reaction to, to what Mr. O'Toole said. Well, I, I see no reason to disagree uh, with his estimate of five to nine seats possibly being, having been affected by this. Uh, I don't know whether he's right or not. Uh, I'm a little less persuaded that, uh, as, as I'm saying in some circles, that he might have uh, held onto his job as leader yeah. if he got yeah. those seats. I'm not sure that was where the party was, was at. Uh, but even if it didn't flip any seats, even if it didn't change a single vote, uh, it's really, really troubling to see the level of interference, which I think by now is incontestable, uh, and, and the many different varieties of it, whether it was spreading misinformation campaigns, whether it was, as it's been alleged, uh, uh, you know, channel, channeling funding to selected candidates, whether it was placing staffers uh, close to candidates uh, who would be helpful to the Chinese cause. Um, you know, there's a whole range of these different things, and they're all really, really troubling, uh, quite apart from the fate of Aaron O'Toole or the Conservative Party, for that matter. Yeah, and, and across party lines, I think that's fair to say as well. That We, we heard from Conservatives, uh, an NDP MP, a, a Liberal, obviously, a former Liberal, Chantal. Well, I'm guessing on the politics of it, uh, one of the questions that uh, will be asked over the next few days is whether Justin Trudeau himself knew about this possibility or had been briefed further than uh, his own campaign manager. Uh, but uh, what I otherwise found more interesting was uh, not Mr. O'Toole's contention, which isn't new and which may be based in fact or not, uh, but the notion that none of the campaign managers were briefed beyond yeah. the usual do not click on this link, uh, Cybersecurity 101, yeah. uh, from the committee that was supposed to oversee the election. And that got me thinking that, you know, the bird's eye view of federal campaigns with an eye to foreign interference can't possibly work. Because if you're sitting at bird level, it's not happening there. It's happening at ground level. And unless you want to pay attention to what's happening in selected writings, you're not going to be effective in warning parties that something is actually happening that is serious. Yeah. So I think the entire notion that um, civil servants high up uh, and security people high up will get together and be able to watch uh, and supervise the election doesn't really work unless you involve people who have actually been in campaigns and yeah, run campaigns. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that does seem to be sort of the, the, the recurring thing here, Althea, that the people who were involved in things, from the candidates to the to the campaign managers, they're the ones being affected by it. And and either they, they weren't told that there were risks or when they tried to raise alarm bells, like Michael Chong said yesterday, they didn't even really get a response, which, which seems just bananas, I think, when you think yeah, about it. Baffling. Yeah, baffling. Yeah. I think there's a few things to kind of pull apart. First is it's clear that the parties were either not treated like their concerns were serious and not enough yeah. information was shared. I think that's obvious. I don't know if you can really say that the Conservatives lost five to nine seats because of Chinese interference. Mr. O'Toole talked about the vaccine mandate. Maybe those Chinese Canadians were more worried about the vaccine mandate than they were about the Conservative stance on the Uyghurs, for example. Who knows? You, I don't think we can determine that. What I do find interesting, though, is this idea of who determines, like, the parties are not uninterested. Sure. One thing that struck out from Mr. O'Toole's testimony was when he said that Daniel Jean, who was the former national security advisor of the prime minister, had overstepped his bounds when he talked about Indian foreign interference affecting the prime minister's disastrous trip to India. And then that was completely inappropriate. But he felt that it was appropriate for him to demand that the, the non-partisan public servant mm -hmm. committee overseeing elections, that he felt he should have been stronger in demanding that they call the whistle in the middle of an election to say yeah. that there was foreign interference happening in some writings. Yeah. 
you know, you can have it both ways. So where is the line? And maybe that line is not clear enough for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. Maybe that threshold needs to be explored. But at the moment, it seems like the commission, because it's so much crowded in secrecy, it's really hard to even be able to understand what's following if you don't have access to the classified information. So I don't know. I feel like we're going to be left from this feeling very unsatisfied. And a lot of the answers that we probably need clarity on, that the parties need clarity on, I don't know if we will get that. Chantal and then Andrew. Uh, I still think it's a, a, a more useful public service to have this commission than the notion from the uh, special rapporteur's report that there was nothing to see there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it at least shows um, the unseriousness from where I sit, looking at what I heard, of the mm -hmm. efforts to uh, watch for foreign interference in the election. Yeah. It also puts some scrutiny, Andrew, probably rightly so, on on how intelligence is gathered and shared and, and how uh, the bar for what gets shared is determined too. Well, we're finding, yeah, I mean, we're still, yeah. the, still to come is, of course, what, you know, who knew what went higher up, but even yeah. what we found out so far, not just about what was shared with people, but what information the investigators had. Uh, mm -hmm. So we found, you know, we had testimony, I forget, was it the, the chief electoral commissioner saying, you know, I, I was, tried to investigate it, but I really didn't have the authority to do X or Y, and so I didn't get very far. Um, the penalties for people who had broken the laws on, on this thing are ridiculously slight. Um, we're finding out, we, we knew a lot about this already, but uh, having it sort of rubbed in our faces about the, the absolute free-for-all of party nomination races, yes. the, the, where you don't, in the Liberal case, not only do you not have to be a member of the party, uh, you don't have to be an adult, and you don't have to be a citizen of the country. A citizen, yeah. So busloads of foreign students come in and help decide who gets nominated in a safe riding, and therefore who gets, uh, it, who gets to become the MP. Um, so I think what all this is showing is just how complacent we have been, how inadequate uh, our laws and regulations and procedures are in dealing with this. And as I say, still to come, possibly, we'll find out what was going on in the higher circles of government while all this was going on. Yeah. And I should say we are going to hear from the Prime Minister in front of that inquiry tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, next week. So we'll probably talk about it. A number of NDP MPs are not returning for the next federal election. MPs Carol Hughes, Rachel Blaney and Charlie Angus shared the news in a joint statement. Angus, a Northern Ontario MP for more than 20 years, was influenced by boundary changes to his riding, while Hughes will see her riding disappear thanks to those same changes. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's sad to see some, some great veterans go, and these are folks that have spent, uh, some of them have spent upwards of 20 years as MPs. There are, um, by my count anyway, at least three other NDP MPs not running again, or one who's already left. What's to be made of this, and, and how will it affect the NDP in the next election? Is there something bigger going on here? Let's bring everybody back. Chantal, Andrew, Althea. Chantal, um, I'll, I'll get you to go first. I, I do think that the, the boundaries around riding has affected people's decisions. I'm not questioning that they want to go hang out with their family. People like to say that. But I think when the race gets harder in a riding, you have to sometimes make difficult decisions. Well... Uh, when Thomas Mulcair led the NDP and they believed they had a shot at government, almost none of the veteran MPs <laughs> left. Uh, and when you look at today and you look at the MPs who are part of the backbone of that caucus leaving, it's bad news for the NDP. Let's mm. be serious. There are serious challenges for those votes in Northern Ontario. The two MPs who are leaving have a major advantage with incumbency. It's a lot easier to beat a, a newbie than yeah. to beat someone who already holds the seat. So I think this was, one, not a good day for the NDP and certainly not a sign that the party is uh, anywhere close to being on a roll looking at the next election. Mr. Singh said in another clip uh, that he's got an exciting array of, of candidates lined up to replace those people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chantal. Just to yes, say yes. that this yeah. is the same leader who danced on election night after having lost how many seats? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I forgot about that. I forgot. And I, I, I blank things out of my memory, Andrew. Yeah. Came okay, back mean, goes down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A, a couple of ridings might be explained by riding boundary adjustments, sure. but when you're up to, I think, half a dozen now, um, something else is going on. Uh, look, the, the Liberals are down, but the NDP are not up. Uh, and in fact, they've been fading in the polls in the last few weeks. They're now, I think, around 18%. Um, and if, if the Liberals do make a comeback, if, the, you know, if this new scrappiness from the Prime Minister signals anything, it means there's going to be a, a real 
uh, the usual liberal squeeze saying, you know, we've got to stop the, the yep. hated conservatives, uh, NDP, you can't afford, you NDP voters, you can't afford to quote unquote waste your vote. Sure. Um, it, this is not setting up as a really auspicious election for the NDP. Althea? Yeah, it's not just that it doesn't bode well for the party. Like, it doesn't bode well on Jagmeet Singh. This is a quarter of his caucus <laughs> that has decided to walk out the door. <laughs> So these three, Daniel Blakey in Manitoba, who went to work for Wab Canoe, Richard Cannings and Randall Garrison in British Columbia have also both said they're running. There may yeah. be more, I don't know, but yeah. uh, or I don't know off the top of my head. Um, this is a lot of people. And if the leader wanted to keep these people in the fold, he would try hard. And it doesn't seem like he has. Now, I think yeah. it's not just the riding boundary changes which I'm not going to dismiss. It can be hard to, you know, when your writing basically vanishes, you compete against a colleague in this case. I guess they decided not to do either. Um, but the tone has also changed. Like mm. Charlie Angus has spoken and he's even posted um, audio clips on the internet, but some of the voicemail and the hate yeah, that he yeah. has been getting in his writing. Yeah. And Mr. Poilier has made no secret that he has targeted uh, Mr. Angus's writing. He's visited more than a de half a dozen times. Um, but the vitriol that is out there against certain MPs, I think also contributes to the idea of like, what am I doing this for? Do mm -hmm. I want to keep doing this? But it doesn't dismiss anything. I think Chantal was right off the bat. Like sure. if it looked like the NDP were going to win, these people would not be leaving. Another writing would have been found for Carol Hughes. Yeah, I should say Pierre Poiliev also went after Angus today, even on the day he said he wasn't going to run again. And, you know, think of that what you will. But um, that also happened. Chantal, last word, yeah. He went after Angus because Angus stands uh, with many more traditional NDP voters uh, as, as someone that represents the party. And uh, this is a bigger loss than uh, anything you've heard from the NDP today. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you all. Appreciate uh, appreciate you. I appreciate spending time with you. That is that issue for this week. Don't forget, you can catch The National on YouTube and CBC Gem. You can catch me on my show, Rosemary Barton Live Sundays at 10 a.m. Eastern. Thanks for watching.